Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the final day of the Academy and the third in the History Strands. Um, I'm going to introduce Ellie Lee, um, who will be lecturing today. Ellie is the leader in social policy at the University of Kent, where she's also director of the Centre for the Study of Care and Culture. She's going to be speaking today about social Darwinism, the organic society. Um, so without any further introduction, Ellie. Thanks. Um, Frank Brady's lecture yesterday on Marxism is a tough act to follow. Um, I'm hoping that the way we can use the time this morning is to look in some detail at an issue he raised of the emergence in the 19th century of social determinism. Um, that's to say, the idea that what we are as people um, is determined by society. To address that topic, I'm going to follow, uh, cover the following areas. First, social Darwinism is a term. Secondly, the varieties of social Darwinism. So the features of social Darwinism. And if time allows, I want to make some comments on Herbert Spencer and finally on Darwin. The comments I'm going to make are derivative, by which I mean they emerge from my reading of the suggested literature. I do think, however, that the written work on this subject area um, is very good and very rich. Uh, myself, I found the Greta Jones book particularly helpful. Um, John Peel's introduction to this collection of essays by Herbert Spencer and also Thomas Dixon um, on the history of emotion. So if people wanted to um, do more reading after this weekend, I would suggest those are very good places to look at further. First then, social Darwinism. I think the term is probably most familiar to many of us, certainly prior to coming here this weekend, as a way of denoting a reactionary point of view associated especially with racial thinking. <clears throat> Notes Leonard, while Darwinism enjoys enormous prestige and influence, arguably more than at any time since the publication of The Origin of the Species, social Darwinism, in marked contrast, functions as an omnibus term of abuse, enough that no one has ever self-applied the term. Leonard thus suggests this perception of social Darwinism relies in large part on the arguments and influence of Richard Hofstadter's work, Social Darwinism in American Thought, which many of you may have read in preparation for this weekend, and Hofstadter's effort to separate the case for state-guided progressive reform from associations with the biologically rooted enthusiasms of reformers in the progressive era in the US, namely their support for eugenic scientific racism and race-conscious imperialism. In other words, ideas about what social Darwinism is can be understood as shaped in large part by reactions from the 1940s onwards to eugenic and racial thinking, and more generally to contestation over the use of biology and social sciences in that more recent period. People may also be familiar with the literature from the 1970s onwards, contesting the term sociobiology um, and the debate in particular about the work of E.O. Wilson. However, an interesting point to emerge from the literature is the insight that social Darwinism was in fact barely used as a term in the 19th century and early 20th century. Leonard thus notes that reviews of the literature found only one instance of the use of the term before 1916, only 49 references 1916 to 1943. However, he found 4,258 citations uh, about the term from 1944 to the early 2000s. The same author notes also of early usages that the term social Darwinism, insofar as it was used in the 19th century, quote, more commonly referred to competition among groups, nations or races, than to competition amongst individuals in groups. The point here then is that historically, insofar as the term social Darwinism was used in the 19th century, it was not used to uphold the necessity of struggle for survival and competition between individuals in the laissez-faire sense of the term in which it's become latterly associated, particularly through the work of Hofstadter. Social Darwinism as a term is therefore perhaps best understood as a post hoc description. Most notably, nobody labelled themselves as social Darwinists in either the 19th century or early 20th century. And in this sense, I think the term should be distinguished from eugenics and Malthusianism, since these were really <coughs> the terms that organisations, organisations and individuals used themselves to describe their anger, from which they sought to popularise. The reaction against biological thinking from the 1940s onwards is itself an interesting area to consider. I think, though, that is not our main consideration here. 
And while I will now use the term social Darwinism, bearing in mind um, my prior comments, I'm going to use it as shorthand for a set of ideas that both predate and supersede Darwin, um, so to separate social Darwinism from Darwin. A uh, point of view which sets out a distinct idea about progress and change, that is to say, an idea centred on the notion of the organic society. And with reference to the previous lecture from Frank, I think consideration of these ideas in part allows us to further explore the context for Marx's ideas and arguments. His case and Engels were shaped at least in some part by their reaction against the naturalistic and deterministic bent of 19th century thought that was so dominant. This is most apparent in their account of the development of a specifically human consciousness and subjectivity, i.e. their ideas about history, but also in their efforts to distinguish natural science from investigation of historically specific laws of motion of society. And for those who are interested, as I noted yesterday, they might want to read, as I did from <coughs> Frank's recommendation, Engels' anti during um, which while, while it has a peculiar concept of the dialectics of nature, also does constitute a very witty and scathing attack on those who apply scientific ideas willy-nilly, creating, as Engels said, theories of everything when they know nothing. Second section, social Darwinisms. An important theme to emerge from the literature is the way that competing fields of opinion and contrasting political orientations commonly lay claim to a basis in evolution. Indeed, an overriding observation that emerges from studies of the 19th century is that contest over the interpretation of evolution was a very important form that arguments about political projects took. Thus, the readings detail how conservatism, liberalism, collectivism, socialism and anarchism all commonly relied on versions of claims about relations between evolution, man's nature and its political expression. Notes Gertrude Himmelfarb, the entire edifice of social Darwinism threatens to collapse under the weight of contradiction, complication and paradox. Laissez-faireism and socialism, racism and anti-racism, segregationism and desegregationism, militarism and pacifism, surely they cannot all legitimately claim to descend from the same ancestor. Yet, like the evolutionary tree itself, they are related, not directly to each other, but to the parent doctrine each deriving from a different part of the doctrine, each with a lineage and legitimacy of its own. And I think one of the most engaging features of the written work on this topic is that it contains a wealth of interesting observations on the underlying commonalities between opposing schools of opinion that emerged in the 19th century. For example, both laissez-faire thinking and anarchism were united by an antipathy to state action, and Jones explains the reason why with reference to the arguments of Spencer and Kretopkin. For both liberals and anarchists, the natural world was a self-regulating entity which required no special institution for its proper functioning. The commentary of Greta Jones's work on the two liberalisms, where she compares J.S. Mill and early advocates of the welfare state, I think is also enlightening in this regard. Notes Jones, social Darwinist versions of liberalism represented the two sides of liberal politics. On the one, they provided reasons for intellectual and political freedom and argued against the dysgenic character of many of the social and political constraints existing in mid 19th century Britain, so that's Mill. On the other, they justified hierarchy, moral superiority and social order. Later on, proponents of the new liberalism, which advocated measures of social reform designed to bring working classes within liberal politics, increasingly appropriated the language of social Darwinism, but it was classic liberalism which first attempted this. And I think this may be an interesting area for, for us to discuss, namely the reasons for the shift in England to a liberalism based increasingly on collectivist social Darwinism, most typified in the arguments made by L.T. Hobhouse. In other words, Jones alerts us um, to the importance um, as the 19th century moves forward, of social Darwinism, the emergence of a very particular underpinning for claims about state action, which I think are important for the later development of British politics. Some have drawn the conclusion, in the light of these observations about the variety of social Darwinisms, that the concept obscures more than it illuminates. 
Rather, I would suggest, however, that the sense in which evolution is called upon and looked to in the 19th century to legitimise such a variety of causes and claims tells us something very important about this age. It suggests there is an overriding characteristic that increasingly marks the thinking of the intellectual elite in this period. But the claim was pressed so vociferously in arguments through the 19th century that effectively my social Darwinism is better than your social Darwinism can form an important starting point for investigation of the period. And again, to emphasise, set against this ubiquity of social Darwinism, particularly in the late 19th century, I think we should again note also the distinctiveness of Marx and Engels and their contribution emerges as very significant. The content uh, specifically of their appreciation of Darwin, um, who they very much admired, runs very much in contrast to the general direction of all other thought on that topic, by merit to their thoroughgoing re refutation of teleology, and the fact that their theory of the development of human society <coughs> included an assault, uh, not a vindication of, attempts to read across from nature. Three, the features of social Darwinism. The most referred to summary of the central aspects of this area of thought in the 19th century comes from Mike Hawkins in his book, Social Darwinism and European and American Thought, 1860 to 1945. He outlines four features of social Darwinism as follows. First, biological laws govern the whole of organic nature, including humans. So the idea that a general law can apply both to nature and to the human world. Second, the pressure of population growth on resources generates a struggle for existence amongst organisms. And if I get time, I'll talk to that at a point a little bit later um, in regards to the um, ancestry of social Darwinism in Malthusianism. Third, physical and mental traits confer an advantage on their possessors in this struggle or in sexual competition which advantages can, through inheritance, spread through the population. <coughs> so this is the theory of acquired characteristics, which is a very important component part of social Darwinism. And last, the cumulative effects of selection and inheritance over time account for the emergence of new species and the elimination of others. And this is essentially uh, the idea of the basis for social progress. Hawkins and Harry is worth dwelling on, and we can discuss those four parts if you want to. But I formulated my own six common features of 19th century thinking, which I wanted to share with you now. <clears throat> Number one, 19th century thinking is characterized by a powerful sense of a need to find a way to reconcile change with order. The dominant sensibility of the time is how to come up with a solution to this conundrum which I think is essentially the point uh, that Frank was indicating this today. Change is certainly accepted, and in some senses very strongly welcomed. And in my view, this is very clear, for example, in my reading of Spencer, who I would suggest is no conservative. This attitude towards change, however, and the embrace of change, carries with it a strong sense that there is a need to find a way to make change orderly. And the subsidiary point is that this preoccupation with order and how to come up with a resolution to the problem of order becomes a more marked concern in the later part of the 19th century. So I think we see a development um, over the 19th century um, and the erosion um, and gradual amelioration of the greater sense of optimism at <coughs> the beginning of the period um, compared to the end. Out of this concern to reconcile change with order, comes, secondly, um, the concern with social solidarity and social unity, uh, which is the vernacular um, or concepts which he operationalised um, to as a way of addressing this concern. However, the impulse to social solidarity to address this tension between change and order um, is formulated in a way which is distinctively secular. So there is a very con strong concern to come up with a secular argument about social solidarity. So there is a strong sense in which intellectuals at this time seek to reject religious authority, leading to a search to find a new basis for order and therefore for morality in new spheres. 
an area we might want to discuss is the concept of agnosticism, which from my understanding is strongly associated with social Darwinism um, and is an important theme of the time. I can't express this more clearly and better um, than Greta Jones does. She argues social Darwinism secularised these ideas, by which she means religious ideas. It removed God, but reinstated the idea of order, equilibrium and hierarchy, this time in social context, but therefore naturalised the social order. Bless you. Social Darwinism <laughs> substituted natural scientific processes for God as the guarantor of social equilibrium. Peel also explains this, I think, very clearly with specific reference to Herbert Spencer. For Comte and Spencer, the appeal of science was that it had authority, that it could and did compel assent, which was just where existing systems of ethics failed. The science was the knowledge of nature, an authoritative analysis of the moral realm was only possible if its subject matter was shown to be part of nature, and this was Spencer's fundamental assertion about society. Evolution circumvented the dangerous inconclusiveness of moral argument by purporting to show how morality was guaranteed by a necessary, scientifically demonstrated process of change. Organic processes were given a moral cachet. The moral principles were read into nature. I particularly like Peel and his insights. I think he's probably the cleverest person I've read on social Darwinism. Because what he seems to grasp particularly clearly about this period, which I think is very important for an understanding of the present, is the theme that emerges quite strongly <coughs> is an attempt to circumvent the problem of uncertainty and to address the problem of uncertainty through generating a basis for its resolution um, in the natural world um, through a scientific der der derivation of moral order which can give us certainty um, and therefore address the problem of not knowing. In other words, what happens in this period is an overriding of the idea that individuals have to engage themselves in a quest for the truth to try and address the problem of uncertainty and generate the possibility of morality, instead by finding an a priori morality in science. In other words, I think that we can see here quite clearly the precursors of what we might now call scientism. Point three, this thinking which searches for this secular basis for social equilibrium and morality is characterised by what I would call thrashing about. <laughs> you find lots of contradictions and th things which seem peculiar and strange in the writings of the time. Um, if any of you have read Spencer, um, you will find this to be true. There's a constant jumping around and searching for the best way of finding the case for order, um, for describing what social solidarity might constitute, moving from overtly naturalistic approaches in which terms associated with the natural world are literally used to explain how human society can and should be, to new ideas of ethics, of psychology, and in the case made for the social and what society is. I think for our purposes, which is really why I raise this point, however, um, it's these last areas which should pre preoccupy us most. That's to say the emergence in this period of new ideas about psychology and new ideas about the social brings me to my fourth point, which is in his last claim for the social, or for sociability, which emerges as the most significant cause from this period of time. Social theory, and specifically sociology, develops as a case or a project in which the concept evolution, that's to say a process of change, begins to function at the same time as a scientific theory about nature, but also as the dominant metaphor for social development. Hence, we find that language from evolutionary theory is quite consciously transferred into discussion of the social. And parallel theories about the development of human society are developed to run alongside uh, theories of the natural world. We are perhaps most familiar in this, with this idea, in the assertion which was commonly made through the 19th century, that just as animals evolved from lower to higher stages, 
So human society has evolved from the African to the European. Um, so we clearly see a clear manifestation of this approach in racial thinking. However, and I think perhaps more interestingly for us, or more, more important at this point, the case that society evolves also centrally includes the notion that there is an inherent underlying process which works to bind society together behind the backs of men. As Jones explains from the social Darwinist perspective, what bound the social organism together was not authority and political sovereignty, but moral and social sentiment. And I think that comment is particularly important in her recognition that the emergence of an idea that there is moral and social sentiment which binds us together, and that comes to take priority over political sovereignty, indicates the importance of the 19th century in its unseating um, of the sphere of politics. And if I get time again, I'll go on to detail that a bit further. Jones also notes, for example, with reference to the case made by L.C. Fogpant, that the objective was to show how the operation of reason and moral feeling attributes previously associated with individuals can actually be observed in the evolution of human psychology. Hobhouse attempted to give this evolutionary theory a former biological foundation, so that's to say back in time. His was a search for the actual historical moment at which both human intelligence and moral feeling emerged. I.e., his project was to naturalise reason and moral feeling as something which emerged at a certain point in the evolution of the human being. And for Hobhouse, this had important ramifications for politics. He argued in his formulation of what state action should be seeking to achieve, that its aim should be to foster a particular version of the survival of the fittest, that is, to assist the ascent of those who are, quote, fittest morally to survive in a society of mutually dependent beings. Um, and this is one of the earliest advocacies in the project of the welfare state. That the morally fittest shall actually survive is the object of good social institutions, he claimed. And if people wanted to read an excellent study of Pop House, Stefan Collini um, has written a book about sociology and individualism, um, which is an excellent read. While Hobhouse and Spencer were at direct odds when it came to the state, in fact, the first articulation of this claim about the survival of the morally fittest comes from Spencer. As Peel observed, he, that's to say Spencer, saw nothing constant in human society except the unrealized social state to which it was tending. A wholly anti-institutional utopia, so he departs from Hobhouse, a sort of meeting place for hippies in whom self-control has become so internalised that doing one's own thing does not lead to chaos. In other words, in, in Spencer's approach, the social state resolved absolutely the tension between change and order as individuals would internalise the need for self-control and that would act behind individuals um, as a binding force, meaning that there was no need or indeed no reality to either will or conscience. He also makes the very important observation that this way of thinking about the social state runs right through 20th century social theory, and I think is one of the most important legacies of the 19th century. Hence, he explains, the linchpin of modern sociology... <laughs> from the <laughs> Hello? <laughs>
Spencer identified both of these processes. So in other words, his thought was a precursor um, to both the Heimian ideas and Freudian ideas. But Spencer separated them in time as successive phases of, successive phases of evolution, first the tough external constraints and militancy, and the unfelt internal controls of socialised man. Five, to develop this point a little further, it also becomes apparent that in these claims about morality, social sentiment, dependency, and internalised sociability, there is very little room, if any, in this approach for the idea of the individual or the concept of choice. In fact, it is during this period of history that the idea of free will as a virtue becomes increasingly viewed as a perspective that can only make sense from a religious standpoint. In general, the concept will is replaced by the notion of faculty, which is psychological, emotional, physiological, but is also evolved and in common to the species. As Jones notes, to relate biology to social theory implied a recasting of biology to fit the notion that faculty and its exercise was at the bottom of social structure. Or as Thomas Dixon explains in his excellent book um, on the origin of emotion and modern psychology, once Spencer had committed himself to the view that there could be a science of psychology, it followed there could be no such thing as a freely and spontaneously acting will. Just as Spencer endorsed laissez-faire economics on the grounds that competitive evolution must be allowed free play to perfect human society, so without the intervention of the state. So he denied agency to the will in his psychology on the grounds that evolution must be allowed exclusive agency in the perfection of the human mind without the intervention of a governing will. The will then was nothing more than an inherited reflex, a simple mental state informing the link between feeling and action. And I think separate to the very insightful commentary here um, on the way social Darwinism uh, expunges the idea of free will from understandings of humanity. The commentary here on laissez-faire, I think, is an important one, which is oftentimes associated with an outlook which upholds the uh, action of the individual in free will, but I think can be read quite differently, um, at least um, in the work of Spencer. Mm -hmm. Six, another way to think of this process is that the way that change and order come to be reconciled is in a depoliticised form. If there is no free will, then there is no need for politics in its traditional sense. Indeed, there is only the need for administration. And I think that's one of the most important legacies of the 19th century, is the unseating of politics and its increasing replacement of administration. I think it's for this reason, i.e., uh, the argument against will, that what can appear as contradictory positions can have the same underlying central idea. For example, Spencer's deep hostility to the state and early British socialism's love of it are united by agreement in the possibility and inevitability of pulling society together by encouraging social evolution. That is, both Spencer and the early socialists agree that there is no need for the problem of change and progress seep out into the political realm and become a cause of conflict and rest in political context. contest. To quote Jones, and this is specifically on early British socialism, British socialism based its precepts largely on the idea of moral evolution and a regenerated human nature. Many found in Darwinism a justification for the strategy of British socialism, non-revolutionary, and relying upon peaceful acquisition of state power by parliamentary means. His, this is Ramsay MacDonald's, view of the state led to an adulation of certain of its functions, in particular its legislative role. Law was for MacDonald, argues Jones, the ultimate realisation of the common purposes of society. It was therefore the highest expression of moral instinct. Since the moral instinct was the most important factor in the struggle for existence, think back to Jones's commentaries, um, in MacDonald's view, this made law the highest expression of evolutionary development. 
So in other words, what we have here um, is an argument that uh, we don't really need political contest. What we need is the emergence of state institutions which can act in line uh, with bringing out the best um, which we are given by merit of evolution. That's to say the survival of the morally fittest um, and the process of administration and lawmaking um, should seek to achieve those ends. Okay, Herbert Spencer. I wanted to talk about moral evolution, organic solidarity, and the importance of the social in Herbert Spencer's thought to illustrate some of these points I've made already a little bit more. And Spencer is important because, as I'm sure you know, um, he holds a central place in social Darwinist thinking. First of all, Spencer's advocacy of laissez-faire is probably the theme that dominates discussion in the literature. <coughs> in particular, I've noted already the influence of this aspect of his thought in American sociology and the later response to it by Richard Hofstadter um, dominate a lot of arguments about social Darwinism. This is oftentimes what Spencerism has come to be perceived to be. He was far less influential in the 20th century in England, and I think there is an interesting discussion to be had, if not here, about America and the reasons for Spencer's fame there um, and his lack of fame in England. Um, but a look at him and his works before this time, so that's to say not in the American context, so I'm kind of ruling that out for our purposes today, I think can prove more, per more useful for our purposes. Spencer's biographical details are interesting. Note that his background was in non-conformism, and he campaigned against uh, and advocated the questioning of traditional authority. Spencer was involved, for example, in the Anti-Corn Law League with Cobden, with its demand that in Britain the common interests of the industrial classes should take precedence over what was presented as the selfish class legislation of the landed aristocracy. As Peel notes, however, the common thread was the opposition of radical provincial opinion to the traditional state, dominated by the aristocracy and the alien church. The 1840s, when Spencer began writing, with the last period in which a significant middle class leadership preferred to make common cause with their working class fellow townsmen against the aristocratic state, rather than be absorbed into the established system of deference in order to defend property. I make this point to, indi to indicate uh, that Spencer was no conservative, um, that he was um, a product of his times. Um, and while his concern was definitively with order, um, he was very well aware um, of being part um, of a new class and a new context. His work and the debates they generated are also very illustrative of thrashing around. Spencer's writings span a long period of time. His books include In Social Statics, Principles of Psychology, The First Principles of a New System of Philosophy, based on his book Progress, Its Law and Cause, Principles of Sociology and the Man versus the State. I make this point simply to indicate that he was trying to generate what in his words was a synthetic philosophy, an integration of all areas of thought um, subsumed to one overarching theory. In other words, his project was to both develop a general theory of everything based in evolutionary precepts and generate the case for a synthetic philosophy using ideas from biology to generate theories about economics, psychology, ethics and politics. His ideas. Spencer first is famous for turning Malthus on his head. Arguably, the originator of social Darwinism can be thought of as Malthus, in that he collapsed the natural and social worlds from one into the other. Much has been written about how both Spencer and Darwin got thinking having read Malthus. But Spencer's ideas about the growth of human population are in fact the inverse of those of Malthus. Hence, where Malthus actively opposed progress or change of any kind, Spencer saw change in everything. It's both inevitable, but also positive. Also specifically for Spencer, population pressure was a motor for change. In his theory of population, he thus argues that this constant increase of people beyond the means of subsistence, <coughs> involving, as it does, an increasing stimulus to better the modes of producing food and other necessaries, involves also an increasing demand for skill, intelligence, and self-control. 
involves therefore a constant exercise of these, that is, involves a gradual growth of them. The most evolved species were also, argued Spencer, the least fertile. For those interested in reproductive health, you may be interested to note that Spencer believed the overproduction of sperm in man led to stupidity and inanity. <laughs> <laughs> and those who became wise to this and so produced less sperm would win out in evolution. <laughs> Hence, the English were consistently contrasted by Spencer in his work to the stupid Irish. <laughs> there is a serious point there. <laughs> the survivor of the fittest was Spencer's term, not Darwin's. Spencer coined the term the survivor of the fittest in these writings of his on population. And while his starting point was that discussed already, namely about population size and growth, and the impulse he thought it generated for positive change, and thus it's linked to progress. The idea of the survivor of the fittest also has other connotations in his work. A key point discussed in the literature is that Spencer's ideas about fitness and the psychological dimensions of his argument specifically. Character, or faculty, are his terms, and they are central also to the process of evolution to the fittest in his approach. The most desirable species characteristics, including altruism and morality, will, argued Spencer, be acquired by the next generation through the process of evolution. So as Peel puts it, Spencer pictures human history as one long process of mankind's adaptation to the requisites of perfect social life, where all men would be free because all would be altruistic. Thirdly, Spencer's is a general, non-religious theory of everything. The synthetic philosophy in which the same underlying law or principles can be identified. Argued Spencer, whether it be in the development of the earth, in the development of society, of government, of manufactures, of commerce, of language, literature, science, art, this same evolution into the complex through successive dif differentiations holds throughout. Thus, society itself in this approach has the capacity to exert authority and control because it evolves to do so. Society for Spencer contains a homeostatic checking mechanism through which the means emerge to maintain order. This is what he termed impersonal compulsion. Fourthly, society based in this sort of progress to a state of order can only evolve fully in Spencer's view when the state does not intervene. And this holds notably not only in economic life, but also through military means or through welfareism. So he was a determined pacifist, Spencer, um, and unusually an opponent of the Boer War. To put this another way, as the evolved society or the social was to be the underpinning of order, unity and progress, the social should and must take priority over other forms of authority, including politics and for Spencer, especially the state. And this view is predicated on his forthright case against free will. As Peel explains, Spencer's sociology was thus much more than an expression of economic individualism. I've already suggested, I think, his idea of laissez-faire is largely misunderstood. Argues Peel, he naturalises society and suggests it is governed by imminent principles of growth valid independently of the wills of men, which should never and ultimately can never be disrupted by interventionary actions. Okay, finally I wanted to make a few comments on Darwin. Was he a social Darwinist? These are brief comments to end with, um, because this is an interesting discussion point in the literature, although perhaps not one that should absorb most of our time. My first point is that if Darwin hadn't wrote The Origin of the Species, social Darwinists would have found an equivalent idea, and indeed they already had. So as I've noted already, the survival of the fittest predates Darwin and his Spencer's ideas. Um, and formally, Spencer in any case drew on the theories of Lamar <coughs> and Darwin. As Jones argued, there would have been a conscious search for biological <coughs> underpinning to the social sciences, even if Darwin had never existed. Social Darwinism was to a great extent the product of existing assumptions about the character 
sociology. Distinctions clearly can and have been made, therefore, between the theory of evolution and Darwinist ideas about the organic society are not the same thing. To concentrate too exclusively on the reappearance in Darwinian guise of many of the notions of the natural and moral economy, which Spencer revived with such effect in the 1880s, would not do justice to the real changes in development arising from the origin, argues Greta Jones. Initially, at least, Darwin had a disruptive effect upon the ideologies of social life. In other words, I think that our discussion of social Darwinism should make us blind to the phenomenal impact that Darwin and the origin of the species had on unseating um, preconceived ideas about things, which is part of the reason why Marx and Engels were such Darwin fans. However, Darwin arguably did contribute to social Darwinism, most notably through his subsequent works, The Descent of Man and his writings on psychology. Uh, and my final quote um, comes from Thomas Dixon. Expression, he argued, which is Darwin's book on psychology, offered a naturalised narrative of the fall of humanity from a state of voluntary control over our bodies and behaviours, like that enjoyed by Adam and Eve before the fall, to a state of enslavement to useless physical urges that are disobedient to our wills, like the state suffered by us all subsequent to the fall. And I wanted to end there because I think probably that is the important <coughs> legacy of social Darwinist thinking, um, including, contributed to by Darwin in his later work, um, a projection of humanity um, as creatures uh, subject to our um, unconscious desires um, and uh, biological uh, wills and urges. Um, no longer people, um, which even have the benefits of uh, a religious concept um, of self-governing agents with will and agency. Uh, thanks, Ali. There's a lot there, obviously. Um, I'll come straight out so that Ali can have a bit of a rest and we take some questions and comments to get things going. So can I see... Um, uh, yeah, okay. That was really good, Ellie. I was wondering if you could um, sort of clarify something that's confusing me. How do they reconcile the sort of theory that um, you have the survival of the fittest, both physically and morally, with what I said also around that time you had the fear and the growth it's, uh, of the sort of the swarm of the, ma the masses? Um, John Kerry puts it brilliantly in his book, The Intellectuals and the Masses, well, the masses were breathing too much and there was this elite fear that this life-ridden sort of swarm was taking over the shires. Um, so they sort of, they seem to be, the moral, morally inferior seem to be sort of growing. And you were saying that, I was trying to, Spencer's maybe argument was that state intervention was a bad thing, maybe allowing that to happen. But surely at that time, state welfareism was nowhere near as developed uh, in, in terms that we think of it today. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the connection between um, the evolution of society and the view of the individual as uh, not a conscious agent, but um, the acting on biological urges or acting on... Um, and it, it, there's like, I've never really thought about this before, but there's like a logical connection between the two things. Because if it's, if it's, at the end of the day, society is composed of us, we think of individuals. But if you see society as <coughs> evolving, then the, that necessarily, the logic of that is that individuals cannot um, be thinking individuals because society has to evolve through a process whereby individuals are acting unconsciously in some, in some way. So that's like a logical connection that I can sort of see in perception of this book. How did that happen like in terms of the historical thinking at the time and how the two things connected? Yeah. Um, and he makes the point that religious authority was rejected uh, in favour of the naturalised social order of the idea of natural laws from um, a new source of authority. So I was just wondering, was it, wasn't it the case that that new form of authority was based on the promotion of scarcity. And so authority was based on the idea of scarcity of natural resources. And I think that's where the Malthusian religious social 
Darwinism uh, comes into play. I think that, the, the, I mean, it's similar, I suppose, to Kent's point, but the promotion of scarcity was the supposed natural law of okay, social Darwinism, its authoritative arguments. And I suppose in recent years, you can see there's been an attempt to revive the notions of scarcity of natural resources as a way of providing a, a positive opinion of environmentalism. Um, in a similar parallel, use of scientism to replace politics is also coming into play, based again around the discussion of scarcity and an authority based on scarcity. Okay, all right. Jacob. Um, if, well, in your fourth uh, point, Ellie, about um, when you talked about how we found how the social Darwinists were bound together by a moral and social sentiment, um, and how that unseats political authority, there was there's uh, two things that came from that for me. First is um, how that uh, assumption seems to underlie a lot of um, the arguments and the logic of the arguments for intervention in other countries in in times of uh, war or genocide or um, or like in, in Syria, for example, like this um, idea we're bound together by the moral and social sentiment, so we must therefore go to be regardless of any uh, political concept. Um, uh, I, I think that's something you're to. The second thing is um, uh, how that assumption is actually really prevalent in um, uh, in the ethical thinking that cropped up in G. Moore and W. D. Ross, especially. And um, W. D. Ross, when he talks about how how you can ground ethics, I can get a quote. He says, "Um, uh, the uh, moral convictions of thoughtful and well, well educated people are the data of ethic, ethics, just as the sense perceptions of are the data of natural sciences." And there's this idea that, and I mean, the classic thing that, that clever people tend to say about uh, G. Moore's naturalistic fallacy is it's not naturalistic and it's also not fallacy. And in fact, there's a supposition of man in nature and being a part of nature that actually underlines all of the um, how G. Moore characterises what, what morality is. I was listening last night to something understood, and uh, they talked about good manners. And Speak up a little bit, please. I was listening last night to something understood on the radio, and they were talking about good manners and courtesy. And it seems to me that good manners and courtesy is related to me trying to be polite to the elite, and perhaps to join the elite. And this brings me to Norbert Elias's book on the civilizing process, and that violence is part of human nature. Well, that's my word. And that uh, what, what you didn't mention, one word you didn't mention, you might have used another word, but interdependence is important. That's why we've given up. Or we sometimes stop invading other people's territory to get their resources because we're going to the We need them and they need us. So that uh, you haven't mentioned independence. Did you? <laughs> That's another word. Okay, any others? Um, Stuart, and then I've got one thing to clarify with Ellen. Yeah, um, how does it balance up in terms of the idea of autonomy at the time? Because from my reading, it's still throughout much of the 19th century, the idea of autonomy would be strong, especially in terms of the family. Um, I can't quite work how these things uh, mix together. There's one other thing I, I wanted to ask you. I don't know if it's specific to, uh, to Hopas. Um, but you talked about the need for state action to facilitate those fittest morally. I mm -hmm. that. And does that imply that there are, there are other fittest yeah. that you know, left to their own devices that immoral people will be more successful and the state gets to step in? And is that quite that was the spin to? Well, to start there, I think one thing, I don't want to let any of these people sound like they're nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all really happy for, you know, loads of people to just die out. Um, and that includes Hobhouse and Spencer. Um, so some of the passages and commentaries in their work were just very brutal. Um, you know, so just because um, Spencer wasn't the same as Malthus uh, doesn't mean he was somehow had a really kindly attitude towards, um, you know, the agricultural working classes or something. I mean, he definitely didn't. Um, and this comes through in um, Hobhouse's arguments about um, why he particularly wants the state to play a role uh, in the um, fostering of the um, best morally fittest, morally best fittest, I can say it. 
So he has a specific disagreement with um, Spencer about the state um, and whether the state does or doesn't have a role to play um, in assisting social evolution. But Hobhouse makes it very, very clear, um, and this is in all the prefaces to the comments he makes about um, the importance of morality in the formulation of the early state, is he makes it very clear that you know, I have no disagreement with Spencer um, when it comes to the need for some people just to die out. Um, and that aspect of um, evolution needs to take its own course. Um, so for example, in Spencer's view, that was the, the overbreeding Irish. Um, you know, they just carry on overbreeding. That would become manifestly um, a way of going on that was against the interests of evolution. Loads of them would die. Um, but that's absolutely fine because then they would end up more like the English. Um, so that kind of way of thinking is ingrained in, in all of their thought. So it's a specific um, argument with Hobhouse um, about the role of the state um, and uh, foster it. So in other words, on those who were morally unfit, I mean, Hobhouse just wanted them all to die, um, <laughs> basically. Um, that was, you know, he's happy with that. I suppose the main point that I wanted to make in response to um, people's questions is that one of the things I think is most challenging when you read about this period, which is why I made those first comments on social Darwinism, um, is that while it is important to try and identify certain overriding features of thought at the time, um, and what comes out of it, this period is the most important thing, and what is the legacy it leaves, I think it's a mistake to then think everything was all the same and everybody was arguing the same thing and there weren't any contradictions there. Um, because actually I think there's lots of them. Um, so that goes back to say Himmelfarb's point on the varieties of social Darwinism and that's a big theme in the whole thing. And there's loads and loads of contradictions in what people are arguing all the time. And they're all having rounds with each other over dinner parties. I mean, these people are all hanging out together. Um, as it happens, um, you've heard that Spencer and George Eliot were um, sexually entwined, creating a direct <laughs> relation with the people in the next room. Um, so they're all sort of <laughs> um, hanging out together discussing these things. I mean, there really was an intellectual elite um, who were trying to work this stuff out, and it was very contradictory. I mean, some of the underlying contradictions, I think, which is why I think it's worth us perhaps um, taking some comments on the difference between the early parts of the 19th century and what happens later and how the changes in thought and argument relate to wider things that are going on. Um, is that some of it is related to the emergence of um, a more urbanised um, context, um, you know, international developments with um, working class organisations and what goes on with the British working class, but maybe Frank can tell me whether that's right or wrong in terms of how any of this works itself through, um, in terms of ideas about the social and whether at some point um, and already given the sense of the need to reconcile change and order comes to be more influenced by a specific reaction to the fact that there is an urban working class. Um, and at what point, so these ideas come to be in some sense more shaped by the fear of the masses or something like that. I mean, my sense is that that's important for um, you know, what we might call modern politics in Britain, um, so kind of late 19th century going into early 20th century. But I don't know whether that's overstating kind of that side of the picture. Just on a point about that, you talk about the shift over the 19th century to the role of concern of reconciling change and order, yeah. but laterally towards making change orderly. Was it that before that there was an idea that you could stop change? Well, no, I think that, so if, say you compare Spencer to Hobhouse, which is the paradigm in most of the literature, Spencer is basically a utopian. He has a teleological view, and he's a utopian, even if he's a really nasty utopian. <laughs> so he thinks it's just a kind of onward, nobody has to do anything, and that um, all that really you need to do is understand the synthetic philosophy, and everybody needs to realise how it goes on. And then as um, <coughs> Peel puts it, you know, it will just sort of generate into this utopia of hippies all hanging out in an altruistic way. There won't be too many of them because we've got over the problem of sperm. Um, you know, we'll be orderly. Um, Laissez-faire will have ordered the economy in line with our um, evolutionary adaptation towards uh, the sphere of production. So it'll just all happen. 
And that's what underlies his antipathy towards state intervention, because he thinks that's going to hold it all up. So he's kind of, and it's very, very marked, particularly in his early stuff. I mean, he becomes a real sourpuss um, towards the end of his life, um, and then goes to America. Um, but his stuff sort of um, earlier on in the 19th century is you know, all about the kind of onward march of progress. Um, you know, and he's, as I say, a bit more sort of dyspeptic and, you know, lonely later on. So that, that's his idea. But what the, the big arguments that then need, that then start to emerge, which I can only understand through relating them to more widely what's happening in terms of the emergence of other tensions which create problems of order in society is that more people, more social Darwinists, start making a social Darwinist case for something to do with policy in the state. So when you got to kind of 1880 onwards, you know, it's much more hothouse, um, eugenicists, you know, we've all got a kind of same way of thinking, but they're much more into doing something um, to foster the evolutionary project. You know, that's the idea that they use to underpin their case for um, you know, whether it's Mary Stokes or I don't know, whoever, um, some kind of program of intervention, um, although they're all very keen on this kind of idea. So I suppose my, ex my explanation for that at the moment is that that increasing propensity toward um, looking to administration and policy um, and some kind of governmental action in some form is related to a changing perception of the problem of order and it's becoming much more related to the problem of the urban working class. But I don't know whether that's kind of too lefty. Is my question, <laughs> is my question on interdependence and violence irrelevant? Um, it's not irrelevant. I mean, they are very <coughs> interested in um, creating dependence. Um, I mean, certainly Spencer. What about Elias? Pardon me? Elias. Elias. Um, I'm not sure that, I mean, we can have a discussion about Elias, how that exactly relates to this line in thinking, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't really well, thought about that closely enough. You know. I don't, I mean, as it happens, I like Elias and I really like the civilising process, and I've never read it as a social Darwinist text. Um, so, but I can't go any further on that right now. Okay, um, carry it, Frank. Um, quick thing, it was interesting. I wasn't able to read all your recommendations, Ali, but the Hoff, I, I get nervous because I say Hofstetter. every author wrong. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the Hofstadter, you almost felt, because I found it really interesting, although you could see how it was this real attempt to just the vilification of everything, um, social Darwinist, in order to justify state intervention. I mean, I put it crudely, but that's how it seemed to me made you want to find something aggressive in the, in the social Darwinist because you kind of reacted against the extent to which it was the denial of the individualism and you felt that, I don't know, is he, was he, is he caricaturing social Darwinism to make his case? Because you did feel that there was that, I'm not saying it's ever got aggressive impulse, but you felt, um, so your point about the individual um, really being denied in the whole of social Darwinism, yet it seemed in the way Hofstadter writes is that it is about the rugged individual and that great spirit, yes, given by nature, but nonetheless that positive impulse, which he hates, just me. So I just have a bit of a question, is there anything that we can take that's less than crap? from our understanding of social problems. And the it, important to understand, I'm not doing <coughs> that. Secondly, in terms, maybe this is not for the discussion now, but you wonder why, given the hostility both in for a long time about social Darwinism and its reactionary implications and content, how is it or is it wrong to catch are by caricaturing some of the sort of dreadful biological explanations that are now incredibly trendy today, do they have their roots in this? Or, because they seem to deny it as well. You know, some of these, the hardwired, you know, all the neuroscience and that stuff. Is there a relationship? 
that correct? Well, there is, and, uh, and, and the, whole, that's the, whole, the whole point that I think what Elliot is making is that as a term social Darwinism can be very mystified because it just happens to be the label attached to those individuals who try to uh, deal with the problem of moral meaning by recasting it as a problem of nature. Because if you go into the domain of the, of the nature, it's much easier to come up with clear answers about questions than it is in, in relation to what is right and what is wrong. And I think it's this moral illiteracy that dominates Western thinking since the yeah, 18th century, 19th century, and gradually leads even religious thinkers away from theology towards nature because it's, it's a much more tangible, much more physical way of dealing with these kinds of problems. And I think what's interesting is what happens almost immediately after uh, the period that Ellie is discussing because what happens is that you have in the late 19th century this uh, sociological rhetoric for social Darwinism. It's, it's meant to be about the social and the logical priority of the social creating order and and everything else. And then what happens is just as, 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 as they kind of say this, people begin to get a little bit uncomfortable with that. And you have the discovery of the unconscious, and you have the discovery of the irrationality of the unconscious consciousness. And all of a sudden, psychology begins to come to what is sociological. And increasingly, the so social sociology itself becomes almost you know, almost totally connected to psychology. All the sociological theories are actually psychological theories. They're about, you know, human irrationality, and uh, they're about, uh, you know, sort of what is it about human beings? And the answer that is given periodically is that actually the reason why you have order is because people are psychologically predisposed to follow you know, sort of through a variety of means, the pressure is placed upon them by their leaders, by their customs and everything else. And all the arguments today about how we're, we're the, the slaves of advertising, the slaves of suggestibility, that what television does, it determines what we do, I and mean, all those media effects, everything else, are the modern version of that. That's one of the point, which is precisely the same arguments that Ellie talked about are now you know, sort of in the air and dominate public life because it's interesting. See, they think about the social government's policy making, like top House, is that they have a policy that's unimplementable. Yeah. Right? That's, that's the thing. There's no way policy is going to make, you know, bad people good. And there's no way that, you know, existential problems are going to be solved by some guy sitting in Whitehall. And, and, and that brings us today this bizarre part. We have a conservative government. We think we at least know how to spell the word conservative, no matter anything else. Going on with the Sure Start programs. You know, you've got the Sure Start programs. You've got Louis, uh, Louis Casey, I don't know if you've heard a couple of weeks ago, yeah, yeah. who decided to spend all this money on the, uh, on the problem families by you know, investing all this money. You know, sort of somebody going to put the problem families right by a variety of both coercive and non-coercive kind of means. And this fantasy that somehow, you know, through these kind of, what are essentially social dominance policies, you know, you're going to you know, sort of kind of reconfigure the balance between good people and bad people. You know, sort of, is going to merely be the latest <coughs> chapter of yet another failed attempt to deal, you know, sort of existential problems through administrative technocratic means. And it seems to me that what you have is this kind of continuous class of policy making, you know, where you don't have the political will, the, you don't have the intellectual confidence. So what do you do? You call in you know, some kind of biological or psychologically uh, focused from a social intervention, which, which will fail. And if you look at it, we now have a, 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 an experience of over 150 years of social policy making uh, with total <coughs> failure. I mean, you know, the American experience, the French experience, every policy does not result in its intended outcomes. You know, every policy seems to make the previous cycle of problem families even worse. 
you know, and, and instead of saying, well, actually, we've done this now, you know, maybe it would be better if we didn't do anything. <laughs> it couldn't be any worse. You know, so that simple conclusion is just not wrong. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> it's really interesting where you, um, um, where you ended up because, yeah, that's <coughs> such a <coughs> discussion in the 60s as well, really. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the fall that you mentioned um, right at the end. Um, what, what was the fall? What constituted it? Or, or what, how's, how is that fall um, <coughs> explained? And, and also, to what degree was there a fight um, over the location of um, the self or psychology um, in nature, given, you know, going back to Hobbes, the idea was that, that personality was constructed um, on a sort of tabula rasa, um, so to speak, and the contest um, over the psychic self, um, you know, later on in the 20th century, in a reaction to naturalised psycholo psychology, the medicalisation of madness and all the rest of it returns to some of those more um, constructed um, notions um, of the self, even though there is still a recognition of the conflict um, between the orderly world of rational rules um, and some more sort of primal um, intrinsic self underneath it or somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wondered uh, what, whether you think there is actually an idea of progress that they're trying to biologise, um, as opposed to today, which all you can see is a kind of all to time. And the difference between those two things, at what point in the 19th century there is a proper abandonment of progress in the sniffing, or whether it's never actually there. It just sounds a bit more optimistic. Because uh, um, that does seem to be something different, where there's a sense of, of the society as a whole moving forward, whereas there is nothing like that in the thinking now when this occurs. It's a sense of you could save individual families. And there is, a, a, when Louise Casey was interviewing the Times yesterday, she's talking about salvation in a very weird way. She's breaking down in tears and talking about um, the, a miraculous salvation of, of particular families. But there is no sense really that the whole society will move forward because of that. It's just this kind of clutching around um, some, some kind of idea of hope, <laughs> but there's not even a sense that you could move, to, that we're trying to move society forward in that way, it's purely that you're trying to stop society being dragged further down. Okay, so do you want to come back to or do you want to uh, No, I'll come back now so I don't forget where I am. On that, um, I think there probably is, I mean, um, you know, you certainly get that if you read Spencer, although I don't think that means that there's anything, to come back to Carrie's point, I don't think there's anything to take from Spencer, if you like, if you want to kind of work out um, how we move forwards from here. Um, because the entire um, construction of the idea of progress is a teleological one based essentially on the denial of individual subjectivity and free will. So. The best will in the world, you're not going to get very far <laughs> moving forwards from that starting point. Um, but it is true to say that, um, you know, I suppose it's a depressing thing to recognise, um, you know, that we've had, you know, a very, very long time of this stuff. So I don't know how long <coughs> is it from between 1840 to now, you know. You, decades and decades and decades of endless articulations and re-articulations of this kind of thinking, um, obviously responding to you know, events in the 20th century, so the racial component of it, um, having you know, particular um, debates and issues associated with that, but substantively um, the same ideas just being um, repeated and reformulated in different ways, um, with increasingly not very much else. Um, set against that, and I think that comes back to one of the points that, that Frank made yesterday about the 19th century and its legacy, um, and the influence of this period for um, moving away from any sort of conceptualisation of um, will um, and therefore of politics in its um, form in which it could be meaningful, and I guess that's what's important about it. Um, which I think comes to this point about the fall, 
Um, I mean, one of the things I think about um, reading some of these pictures. Mm. What's that next day? Claire's one in the middle. It's progress. Um, you know, they're really, it's like Richard Dawkins. I mean, it's just the, the, um, the antipathy towards anything that you could think about from theology or you know, religious ideas of a human being, um, the sense in which you want to rail against all of that is very, very strong in this period. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting about it is it's, um, whether you see it, well, I don't know what quite the balance is. I suppose I don't see the um, sort of antipathy um, to religion um, and the liking of Darwin, specifically, for example, because they see it as a way of, you know, sort of having a go at religious authority. I actually can't take anything positive from that. Um, I mean, you know, maybe there is another way of looking at it, and maybe that's too one-sided. Um, I also don't see it as just something that's pragmatic. I mean, I think there certainly is a sense that you can't, as Frank said yesterday, you can't construct an idea of um, order and social solidarity by going back to, you know, old ideas about um, religion and morality, that, you have to, that there has to be a secular form. Um, so there's a kind of, you know, that's influential. Um, but I also think that um, there is a real sort of hostility to the good sides of um, previous, more religiously oriented conceptions of the human being. Um, and I think that's why the Thomas Dixon book, I think, is a really fantastic study in all of this. Um, and therefore you do end up, once you think of human beings as fallen, And then, um, finding things in the sort of realm of emotion and psychology. And actually, Spence is interesting because I think it's true to say that these points that you make about the unconscious um, and the development of a particular um, psychological frame of reference, that's all actually a lot of that's already in Spencer um, before you get to um, Freud and the, the later stuff or the adaptations of Freud. Um, and that's a sort of really important contribution. And on, on how they go about sort of finding that, it's very odd reading these books. You know, so like Hobhouse, I mean, he does literally try and find it. You know, so exactly when in 17, what, you know, when did, <laughs> as if you can sort of conduct a study, you know, there's a kind of obsession with statistics and methodology as <coughs> part of all of this. Um, you know, the construction of kind of experimental methods to try and find, find this in the person. Um, that all begins to come about in this period, and obviously you've got, um, you know, phrenology is, but you know, the, the emergence of the kind of early human sciences in this period is, I think, is one manifestation of all of that. Um, you know, it's all a real load of rubbish, um, but that's what they're doing. They're trying to find faculty and find when faculty emerged in human beings. Um, Helena, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that set against this, there are some other better ideas about human psychology and emotion. I was just yeah. sitting thinking anyway, that surely there's but, yeah. something positive that's come out of it, but so, more recently I think. Uh, okay. Um, and on um, Hofstadter, I think that the, the, I really, really like the Hofstadter book. Um, I think it's a lovely book, a lovely study, and I really like his writing, but I think what it tells you about is American liberals in the 1940s. <laughs> I don't think it really tells you very much about the 19th century. Um, and I think that as part of that, I mean, I might be wrong, and it could be that there were particular interpretations of Spencer when she was in the States, and there probably is a whole story to try and understand about why America loves Spencer so much, um, which I don't really know very much about. Um, but I think it tells you more about Hofstadter. Um, and I think that the thing that's probably the most important misreading of social Darwinism that can come if you rely too much on Hofstadter is the idea that laissez-faire is about the rugged assertive individual and that somehow you find in that you know, a classically liberal idea of the individual, whereas I genuinely don't think that that's at least Spencer's theory of laissez-faire. It's an anti-individualist individualism, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So laissez-faire is an evolved faculty. It's not a 
choice. <laughs> you see what I mean? And I think there's probably a whole misunderstanding in laissez-faire as an economic outlook that's arisen from that over-association of it with the more, you know, classical liberalism. Uh, you see what I mean? So I think I agree with Frank that the legacy of all of this is, you know, really, really important. I mean, it's the main reason why it's an important area to understand. I think it can uh, be very important. And, you know, if you want to understand contemporary social theory or evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology and evidence-based policy making, then this is the good place to start. Sorry about the noises. Um, we've got 10 15 minutes left, so I'll take as many as I can before I um, finish this up. Um, just in terms of the legacy, I mean, a sort of another uh, oh, perhaps oh, opposite end example of what you were talking about. It, it struck me that in the kind of um, cod economics of free economics, this is quite interesting. The uh, example they make about how uh, crime in New York was thought to have uh, declined in the early 90s because of zero tolerance policy that Giuliani put in and all of that. Uh, but they trace it back perhaps solipsistically to um, the legalization of abortion in the mid 70s. And that strikes me as being a sort of very interesting kind of pick the boat out of that. Now, you know, you know the free economics guys are doing it because you know they'd like to bullshit the world. But actually, there's something spooky in there to me, and I can't quite, I don't know what I'm asking here, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I found the data psychology really interesting, so just on that, you mentioned in the beginning of the lecture that um, society has the capacity to control because society, it's society that evolves, because desire, drive, um, is perceived as a disobedience to our well -being. But then, I think, to me anyway, that suggests that our development as individuals is a product of a struggle, but primarily of sort of a conscious struggle, where the unconscious, although sort of considered, not necessarily part of that struggle, because I guess with Freud, like, the, the concept, you don't even know who the individual is, you don't even know who you are. So I, I was wondering, if you mentioned Peel and the attempt to circumvent the problem of uncertainty, and how would this neglect, neglect the unconscious as, as something we don't precisely understand or can evolve with, something that links in with that. And I thought when you said will has become sort of faculty now as well, so really reason, and again, the notion of the unconscious, which is again, sort of, you know, not understanding, but will becomes faculty, and I wondered what your thoughts were. Jason? Did you remember? Penny, I have a job. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of um, sort of describing the thinking of the 19th century as naturalistic, because it kind of um, turns on its head the way I would have, in my mind, characterized that period, because I'm just a bit as technocratic and associated with material progress and the relief and necessity and all of those things. And I always understood the naturalistic sentiment as being a minority <laughs> strand of thinking which stood against that. So this is really interesting because it kind of suggests that it's sort of, it's, it's much more central to the imagination of the people making the world. But at the same time, to say something relates to nature and to use that word nature probably demands, not in relation to social Darwinism, but more generally demands greater interrogation. So the thing that comes to my mind in relation to this is the idea of the sublime, which is, I think, a characteristic of the later period that we're talking about, but it even begins, it begins a discussion in response to the French Revolution in part of uh, um, sort of romantic literature, where they posit in the cultural yeah, the idea of nature, of nature is not as the given. They say technology is the new nature because that's what compels us and is the given and the things that we can't control. Actually, the agreement we can control is uh, where we put ourselves in relation to nature and it forces us uh, to open up our imagination in a way that we haven't ever done before, which I think is somehow a link to this then discussion about countries and the others. So I don't know whether you think anything about this line in relation to but there, the nature is about unfixing things, about celebrating the transient, rather than the fixed nature of the world. Yeah, I mean, just on this 
naturalistic thinking and, and, and naturalistic thinking versus progress. I think you can you can see that uh, in Spencer, especially I mean in kind of mid Victorian Britain, it's hard not to have a sense of, of kind of progress and, and, and moving forward. But the fact that it takes this this kind of biological form, it it kind of is, is the form in which it kind of becomes more and more kind of brittle, uh, mystified notion of progress that's not kind of explicitly rejected until on kind of wide scale, wide scale until say kind of probably after the First World War or a bit later. But you can just kind of see this this kind of progress becoming more and more uh, uh, mystified. But just to try and uh, 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 dig into what else is happening with this. Uh, uh, kind of disintegration of, of uh, sociology into, into psychology. One uh, dimension of that you can see uh, uh, in, in this period is the kind of separation off of uh, economics, which you know, economics now has uh, uh, become, as mentioned at the front, kind of very uh, 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 wrapped up in all these kind of psychological ideas. But you can see in the period of the 80s, kind of 70s, the kind of basically 20th century economics coming through with the kind of rejection of old classical theories of value and these kind of uh, uh, marginal theories of value. And you look at uh, 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 what you have there, the, the, the kind of uh, breaking apart of, of, of that realm from uh, kind of the rest of social theory as sociology becomes more psychological. Uh, and if you look at what these people like Jevons and Walrus and all these people who are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, developing this, this new economics, the ideas that they're actually drawing on, which is, is, is kind of a bit less well known, are actually ideas from physics. And if you look at all the kind of uh, 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 mathematical equations that they kind of write down that they claim to describe the economy, they're pretty much copied out of the thermodynamics textbooks. Uh, and there's a, a book on this by a guy called Moravsky called More Heat and Light, if you want to go and look at, look at this story. Uh, and you know, it's just an interesting example that both there in a, in a kind of separate parallel uh, discussion to the, the kind of sociology, which understandably is more uh, kind of takes a biological basis in terms of trying to understand the human beings, but in this other kind of fragmentation of social theory, you also get this kind of naturalistic uh, 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 kind of basis uh, 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 to it in, in, in parallel, I think is a, a kind of interesting, useful parallel to, to understand. Okay. Yes, I, I think this may be a, a slightly similar point. I thought about thermodynamics, being, it's really being used as a metaphor for something else. And I think when we talk about survival, and the survival of the morally fittest, we don't mean survival literally. We don't mean living, no. And I think maybe we're taking a metaphor too far. But in biological evolution, with, you are talking literally about survival. And there's no questioning the idea that the fittest survive. Whereas if you, if you use that as a metaphor for a, a moral progression, um, we don't mean survival, we mean success. Now what do we mean by success? Do we mean by having power in a community, having more money than other people? Um, we need to define what we mean by success because we're not talking about survival. And then it becomes fairly clear, if we look at our society at the moment, that you could almost argue that it is the most morally unfit that survive in that sense of having the power and the wealth. Okay, um, okay I'll try and take Kevin, um, <coughs> Sabine, Richard, Peter, I think that might be the answer. Yes, you've got a minute left. <laughs> if you can, as short as you can. That was fascinating stuff. Uh, I'm trying to tease out my mind, though. It could be a red herring, and I could be spitting hers. If there's any difference between the term naturalistic and deterministic, and what, why I'm thinking that is something that Carrie asked, which is why I want to ask is, you said earlier on that the laissez-faire the anarchist saw the world as self-function, etc. And I've always seen, for example, a lot of people at that time who had a theory of human nature, of people perhaps as robust and resilient, able to keep their place in the world. Uh, are you effectively saying that that's a sort of a, a deterministic theory, and that's not particularly positive or progressive, because within that, I would have seen the space for autonomy, etc. Then you talk about that being teleological. Am I confused, or, or are you sticking the boot into 
to that idea as well, which I often see as a progressive one. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I found that brilliant talk just to emphasize that accuracy. Um, the one thing I still have a problem wrapping up my mind around is this uh, conception of <coughs> continuity between the 19th century and what we're seeing today, because at first sight that feels a bit counterintuitive because there was a reaction against social Darwinism, uh, for example, the pragmatists. Yeah. Um, there was, of course, in the context of the, the class upheavals of the 20th century, a strong uh, tendency to assert individualism, albeit not in the sense that we would understand it, but certainly um, to kind of try and reassert a liberal view in Popper, etc., all these people. So, I think, I mean, I find it very interesting. It's something I feel I need to think about. But I wouldn't have thought of it as being such a direct continuity because it was quite contested for a while. And it's only now, and not only now, I'd say maybe for the past 20, 30 years, that this kind of determinist and also naturalist and biologist um, attempt to explain human beings, what they are and what society is, has regained a hold. But I would say in the interim, it wasn't so pronounced, was it? I'm a bit uncertain about that now. Okay, Richard. A um, couple things I'll try and be quick. Um, first, the first law of thermodynamics is really quite interesting because it plays quite well with the issues with environmentalism because obviously thermodynamics is to do with energy, you can't destroy or create it. So, it, those models always rely on there being a fixed system and nothing ever going into or out of it, no, no absolutely speaking progress. Um, second thing is I think there's some interesting interplay with ideas to do with authority in this. And I, I mean, you sort of said earlier that you sort of, you sort of initially almost see these ideas as destroying authority and, and, and leaving the state with almost no job to do at all. And what we know, but what's interesting, sort of drawing what Frank said, is how we've now seen that what these ideas have done though is destroy the kind of subjectivity of people and therefore that's kind of de facto reverted to a position whereby the state's re-able to claim authority and re-able to try and you know, make the Darwinism work. <laughs> Similar theme. Um, I thought the comment uh, that you made, uh, Ali, that uh, the appeal of science is that it had authority uh, was probably a good description of the way people looked at it, but it actually just demonstrates a misunderstanding of science and that uncertainty in science is, a, is one of the extraordinary things about it and the fact that there's constant challenge and it leads to a sort of freedom to analyse uh, exactly the opposite of the way people were trying to adopt it as, as a certainty. So when you use the word scientism, I think that's a fantastic word to, that we should all adopt for the screwy um, nature of the way people come up with uh, explanations for these things and finally that we should learn we should know that it doesn't work in the way that as yeah. described because now you're seeing extraordinary computer models of um, behavior which are being proved to be completely wrong and extraordinarily damaging I and mean, the two best examples and the most expensive ones one on the way um, that financial models were predicting the way um, certain levels of um, prices would uh, work and have been to prove disasters wrong very costly to everybody. And the second one is that <coughs> constantly predict that um, climate models have proved to be completely wrong. Um, so we ought to know that an over-application of certainty of science is actually leading us in the wrong direction and, and getting into areas where other things, more subjective things, are much more important. Okay, sorry to leave. Well, I just want to one more thing and just put the context of the session, talking about the social, as a disavow the political, which I think is a strong theme which has come through. But I wonder how much the political has ever coped with the mass society yeah. through the 19th century. So looking at the, uh, the American situation, the early republic actually quite an elitist view of politics uh, with an agrarian view, very much seen as threatened by um, anyone who's interested. And an idea had to be an elite with being disinterested. And so the social in that sense was always seen as a threat to the political. I think in the 19th century Marxism was the one attempt to deal with that, but its legacy has ended up being a kind of social determinism um, rather than any sense of agency. Um, so you don't have to respond to that. Maybe we should have a strand on Hannah Arendt next year and some of these questions. A few brief points. Science scientism um, is, I think, a really important distinction that, that we need to make. Um, so I very much agree with that point. 
Um, the main things really on the legacy of the 19th century. Um, I think one of the most important things that comes out of it is this um, construction of politics as management um, and politics as administration. Um, and I think that one of the things to work out in terms of the course of events and how things unfold more laterally is how that then turns into a very direct model of politics as the administration of behaviour, or what we understand as nurturing behaviour management programmes, um, and how that becomes possible uh, because of this um, increasing articulation of ideas to do with what the human being is, um, and the psychological and emotional faculties um, of the human being and the unseating of will. Um, and I really think that is a phenomenally important legacy for us to understand. Um, I'm sure it isn't everything about the 19th century. I mean, I'm not a historian of the 19th century, and I would make absolutely no claim to be. Um, Mill, um, Mill, Mill was into some of this stuff. I mean, so he wasn't entirely. <laughs> um, but obviously, he got a whole set of other ideas as well, and that has a legacy. Um, but I do think that um, this becomes very influential. I mean, I suppose it's kind of codifying, it's solidifying, um, which clearly then becomes influential in terms of the course of intellectual life. Um, it's through the discipline of sociology. Uh, maybe we need to do a strand on sociology or something, I don't know. But I think there is an awful lot for us to unpack um, about sociology and the development of social theory. So I'm just going to end with a quote from Peel again, of whom I've become a big fan which I've been one of the students before he retired, um, on the contribution of sociology to unseating history. Yeah, his history is practiced, is accused, this is by um, Spencerian sociology, of dealing with trivia, such as the doings of kings and great men. It is reproached for failing to plumb basic social qualities and structures, for upholding sentimental concepts of free will and indeterminacy, for encouraging false sociological notions for being associated with reactionary social strata. Contemporary sociology, one is sad to say, is often not more indebted to Spencer and in its continued, estra continued estrangement from history. Um, and I think that if you take that insight, um, it's a very important one um, in terms of seeing how um, you get a gathering social theory and a, and a version of sociology and how we think about society, um, which becomes increasingly estranged from history and increasingly estranged from historical thinking. Um, and I think if we could get at that more, then, then it would be really, really helpful in understanding the, the legacy of this period. <laughs>